God really put me something on my heart I kind of want to start tonight with. And and in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 I want to read this to y'all. It says, And let us consider one another, considering each other, in order that we stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let me work that backwards for you. As we see the day approaching, we exhort one another. We don't forsake coming together. And why do we not forsake coming to, together? So that we stir up one another in love and good works. That's the purpose of us coming together. It's not just to, you know, listen to a couple songs together and listen to somebody talk. It's really about stirring up each other. Stirring each other up in love and good works. Testimonies are really important. I think testimonies really demonstrate that fact. When we get up here, we will at the, at the end, we'll get up and we'll share, share testimonies. Testimonies really stir up each other. When you hear the testimony of someone else doing something that was a blessing to somebody else, it touches you. And then you're like, wow. You know what? I know somebody in my life I could, I could speak to as well that would really minister to them. It would really show love in their life. It, it stirs up something inside of you for good works and love. And that's what we do when we come together. That's the purpose of it. Tonight, something, because I just found out a few days ago that I was going to be speaking tonight. And so I started praying to God and asking, you know, what... What, did, uh, what does he want me to talk about tonight? What does he want me to minister to y'all about? And, and a, co- a couple of different things came up. Um, you know, when, when you're listening, when you're, when, you're, when you're praying and fellowshipping with God and you're listening, God speaks to you to me most of the time in a in a a still quiet voice and that still quiet voice is an internal internal voice and it may sound just like you because it's an inner ear not an outer ear so when you when you hear something audible from outside you actually register it differently than when you hear it internally so when I'm speaking to you right now, I hear my voice a certain way. But when I've heard myself on recording, it's like, I sound like that? <laughs> so so your, your inner ear is different than your outer ear. So when your inner ear, when God speaks to you, you hear it inside. It's the same voice. He speaks to you, to, to you through your spirit, your spirit man. And when he speaks to you through your spirit, you hear it in the spirit. And a lot of times for me, it's, you know, I'll, uh, I'll hear God speak to me, and then I'll try to reason it out. Well, I know what I need to talk about, or, you know, or when you're going to speak to somebody else, and you're like, oh yeah, Lord, lead my words, and you pray this, Lord, lead my words as I speak to this person, and you walk up, and you start speaking, and then you start thinking, oh yeah, this is what I need to say, or this is how I need to say it. Well, now you're trying to reason in it. You know, you're trying to you're trying to reason in that, and and a lot of times you can start to work God out of the equation. 
And so a lot of that was happening this week, or a few days ago, as I heard, and I started praying, and I was like, you know what? God, just speak to me and use me. Give me a couple of scriptures I can talk about. So I have a couple of scriptures tonight that I want to talk to you all about. And... I'm going to start in Romans, one of my favorite books. I really love Romans. Romans set me free. So when I was on my spiritual walk of um, making the decision in my life that I was like, you know what, I'm done living for myself. I'm done with this lifestyle. I'm done with all this is going on in my life. I'm going to start living for you, God. I'm going to start walking this out. And so I read through the Gospels to, to, so I could find out an imitation of Christ in my life. Because that's what we're doing. We're supposed to be imitators of Christ. And so when I, when I read through the Gospels, and you know, I, I grew up with the Gospels, and you know, a lot of stuff was sticking out to me, and God was really ministering to me about um, what it looks like to be a Christian. What that looks like to be Christ-like. So I was running through the Gospels, and the Lord was ministering to me. When I got to, and I, I read through Acts, and you know, the, just the the wonderful things the Holy Spirit was doing and moving and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I just really opened myself up to the Holy Spirit to start using me. And then when I started reading through Romans, this was my trail as I was going through of this time in my life where I was trying to transform my mind, renew my mind from its old thinking habits to new thinking habits and a new perspective and way of living. And so when I was going through that, I made it to Romans. And Romans really just, I mean, it is, it's the butcher shop. When, when it comes to your, the carnality of our mind and, and, and who we are and dying to self and turning, turning your mind shift from a carnal way of thinking to a, a spiritual way of thinking. Romans is just really, was what did it for me when I really started saying, you know what, this is, this is, this is serious. This is, I need to focus. I need to, you know, when I was reading through, you know, chapter 8 and 12. And I'm going to start today in chapter 2. I'm going to read through this, and then I'm going to go back over a couple things. Romans chapter 2, it says... Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge, another you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think, O man, think this, O man? You who judge those practicing such things and do the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your, kind, with your hardness and your impotence, impotent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who patient continuance in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey un unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, and on every soul of man who does evil and of the Jews first and also the Greek Gentiles or the rest of us but glory honor peace to everyone who whose works who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile for though for there is no partiality with God man that can seem a little harsh like a hard pill to swallow. When you, when you read through that, it's, it's almost like it's trying to get a gut punch in there. But really, it's freedom. So, 
where does the gut punch come from? The gut punch comes from a, a, a self, a self focus, a self focus. When you're focused on yourself, you can feel like, oh, whoa. But when you when you turn that when you turn that around and say, you know what, I'm God focused. Well, when you're God focused and you read it God focused, what is what does it say then? Well, that, that's freedom in there. It says when, when you judge somebody, when you judge somebody, but then you're judging them for the same things you're doing, do you think that you think that's okay? Or you think that's, ah, it's no big deal. Well, I'm at least better than so-and-so. You know, there's a scripture that says not to compare ourselves among ourselves. It's unwise. But a lot of times, that's where we find justification in our actions. Justification in our judgment of others is by comparing ourselves among ourselves. That's how you reach those standards of judgment. It says, man, I really love this. In verse 4 it says, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, not judgment, not condemnation. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Um, I. Uh, Um, I had some uh, some friends of mine um, that were fire and brimstone type of preachers, and and I believe there's a place for that. There's a place for that in the acknowledgement of life without Christ, but then life with Christ is without judgment, because Christ took the judgment for us so that we could live a life free from condemnation. And it's that goodness of having a life full of His joy, His peace, His love, of kindness. That's what brings people into the kingdom of God. It's when you, like Jesus said, it's it's. It's by those that love that you'll know. Those that love you'll know. They're my disciples. Because it's goodness that really touches people's heart. Because people live in a world full of judgment, condemnation. Uh, you're too fat. You're too skinny. You're not pretty enough. You're not, you're not wearing the right clothes. You're, your shoes are dirty. Or, you know, there's just... All you got to do is turn on the TV for five minutes and they'll tell you everything is wrong with you and you need this pill and this clothing line and, and all that. Plenty of judgment there. But it's actually when you... <laughs> so you, you don't know how God is working in other people's lives and how a simple act of kindness can actually have a huge effect in somebody's heart and in their mind. You know, there's... I've heard a lot of stories about how someone said good morning to someone that needed to hear a kind word and it touched them deep. I had a friend, actually, that... I was, I was talking to my wife on the phone and he was overhearing me talk and um, I was cutting jokes and stuff, and he said, uh, and I got off the phone, and I said, I, I just like, I just want you to know, I was just kidding with my wife, you know. I don't really slap her upside the head. <laughs> and he, he's like, oh, no, 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 I, I know, I know. He, and this is a non-believer. He said, he said, I actually, one of the first things I noticed was your unconditional love for your wife. And it like hit, it hit me because sometimes, 
you, you don't realize who's watching and how they're watching. And how you live your life, how you walk in love, how you treat and talk to people has a huge effect on everybody in your life. Co-workers, boss, people you run into, customers, family, big time. Because family always judge. <laughs> family know you the best. And so, when you, how you treat these people in your life, you never know what kind of impact you're having there. The Bible talks about being diligent. Being diligent in your word and action, your daily life. And there's a reason for that. We're representations of Christ every day, all day. And the little things, and the big things, especially the little things. Every day, the words you speak, how you react to your situational life makes a huge difference in how people perceive not only you, but perceive God as a representation of Christ. As a Christian, a Christ-like one, we're representations. All day, every day. It's not like, it's, it's, it's not like we uh, put on a suit in the morning and now I'm a Christian all day, but then when I get home, I take my suit off and now I can just relax and be me. No. When you're a Christian, who you are is Christ. They're not different. A lot of times we... I hear a lot of Christians quote John the Baptist. Less of me, more of you. But there's still a separation there. So now you're distinguishing that the you is bad. But the you is born again, spirit, filled, believer. 100% God. That's the real you. So Holy Ghost filled, spirit bound, spirit connected, born again is that spirit alignment, spirit connected. That's holy. Now your mind may still have some old habits. Your mind may still need some renewing. And that's where the Bible talks about that's on you. That's your renewing of your mind is on you. The born again part, your spirit being revived in Christ, Jesus did that for us. We accepted it. Jesus did it. That was God. But us, renewing our mind, that's on us. And we do that through the Word. Then we take that into our life, into action. I'm going to take you on down here to... Uh, to the last verse I read in verse 11, it says, after he gets done going through this, and then talks about how we act, and then it says, but glory, honor, and peace, this is in verse 10, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good. Glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good? Wait, 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 glory to me? Did God just say, I get glories who? Or is that glory from Him? Because God lifts us up. Glory, honor, and peace to everyone who work, works what is good. To the Jew first, then the Gentile. For, in verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. Man, that's a good scripture right there. You know, I uh, when I was reading that, that last verse there, verse 11, it really started to hit me because I, you know, I, I came from a, a mentality where I really despised pride. Um, this is before I really started living for God. I really despised pride to the point where I would tear down individuals when I seen pride in them because it just really irked me that somebody could think of themselves better than somebody else. And it would really irk me because I, I grew up 
uh, depressed, depressed, thinking I was the scum of the earth, you know, a sad little boy that couldn't whistle. True story. <laughs> and I, as I got older, I got more violent, and I would, and, and I got more intelligent, and as I did, I found out ways I could try to tear down people emotionally and stuff that, that I seen this in. And it was very destructive and very evil. And, and then, when God was speaking to me, He said that that He has no partiality. There's no partiality with God, which means God doesn't hold one person up above the other. Which means what? That we're all equal underneath God? That we're all treated the same underneath God? What, what does that mean? That, that every single person has the Holy Spirit? That every single person has the same ability that Christ had to do what he did and more? He doesn't treat any one of us different than anybody else. We all have the same God living within us. There's nobody more anointed than somebody else. There's only those that are willing to submit to God and those that aren't. Because anyone submitted under God will be lifted up. But it's when we put ourselves in front of God, that's where we fall behind. When we do things for our own glory, that's where we fall behind. I'm going to take y'all, I'm still going to stay in Romans, but I'm going to take y'all over here. I was listening to the Holy Spirit speak to me and and really start ministering to me. I really, I really, I really enjoy uh, just opening up, kind of uh, not coming to God with an agenda or or a problem or um, a situation, but really just opening up to listen. You know, just praying, saying, God, speak to me, speak to me through your word, opening up the word, start, scriptures just start coming, then I start digging in, looking around, God reveals stuff to me, then brings me somewhere else, or puts something else on my heart, and it's really like an adventure, almost, and, and I don't do it as often as I should, and I think we all could say that, we're all, we're all, you know, man, I, I need to spend more time in the Word, or man, I, I need to spend more time with God. We're we're always there, and and it's like, man, every time I, I start, I get hungry again. It's like, man, that that fire starts to cook up inside, and it's like, man, that's that's really that's that bonding time. That's that relationship when the Holy Spirit's really working on your heart. You're starting to think about it, and you're not. And then what you do is, is after as you start to meditate on that, then you turn around and put it into action. And that's when it solidifies in your life of taking the word, not just being a hearer, but being a doer also, and you put it into action. And then it solidifies it in your mind. And you start to build those new pathways, build those new strongholds, those new strongholds in your life. Um, and it's, it's those little steps by steps that, that really start to move you forward in that life change, in that, in that no longer being subjective to your environment but actually being an influence and a changer in your environment. There's a uh, there's, there's there was two main types of learning back in the day. There was the Greek way of learning. There was the Hebrew way of learning. The Greek way of learning was 
you sit in a big group of people, you listen to one guy talk, and he talks and talks and talks, and you listen and listen and listen. Then you listen to somebody else talk, and then you just sit there and you listen and listen. And then if you can talk as much as you heard somebody else talk, that means you're wise. (laughs) The Hebrew way of learning was that you receive, then you do. Then you receive, then you do. What this does is it solidifies it into an action, not just a mental prowess. There's lots of people that know the word and they, and they can use mental prowess to justify, condemn, or exalt themselves. But it's really when you take the word, you read, then you do. You read, then you do. And when, you, and when you're walking that out, you start to see a difference in the way that you speak to people, in the way that you walk out your life. You start to see a difference in your perspective. If your eye is dark, then the whole body is dark. If your eye is full of light, then the whole body is full of light. The Word says... What does that have to do with? What does your eye do? Your eye has vision. It's a perspective. It's talking about the way you see. If you see dark, your life will be dark. If you see light, then your life will be full of light. He's talking about perspective and the way you angle yourself in life. But how do you fill your eye full of light? Get in the Word. And it'll fill you up. It'll fill you up so much you'll overflow and you can't help yourself. You'll just, you'll just start talking to people and just start ministering the Word. And it doesn't have to be these and thous. It's, this is my life. This is the way I live it. This is what I went through. This is how I handled it. And it's through situations like that that you really minister to people. Because then it's not just words. It's action. It's a lifestyle. I want to talk to you all tonight about responsibility. I have here, uh, this is a definition of responsibility. It's a noun. The state or fact of having a duty to deal with something or of having control over someone. A state or fact of being accountable or to blame for something. The opportunity or ability to act independently or make decisions without authorization. Responsibility is the fact that you have the ability to make a choice and that choice is yours. So what does that mean? What does that look like? So we live in a world today, in this world that we live in, that we're pushing this idea that we are no longer responsible for our actions. That our environment causes us to behave or do something a certain way, and it's not our fault that we did what we did, because it's our environment that has caused this fiasco. But the truth is, is that nobody is responsible for your actions but you. Now what does that mean? That means that when somebody says something or does something to you, you don't react, you act. So a react is a response or an offense to that action. But when you act, you, you, your advancement forward isn't based on what just happened. What does that mean? That means when somebody says something or behaves a certain way to you, 
You don't respond in anger, but you act in love. So you're not responsive, but you're, you, when, you, when you come into confrontation or you come into life situations, but you already know within yourself you're victorious and then you walk in that victory, you walk in that love, you walk in that action, knowing that you are responsible for your own decisions. They're not based on other people. They're not based on situations. They're not based on what anybody says. Or how anybody acts, cutting you off in traffic. Or how somebody, you open the door for somebody and they don't say anything to you and you walk right past. You're like, well, that was rude. Well, did you open the door for them or did you open the door for yourself? Because if you open the door for them, they got through the door. You should be happy for them. If you open the door for yourself, now you're expecting gratitude. You're expecting someone else to respond a certain way well, that's not love, is it? That sounds like more like manipulation to me. When he's doing stuff to get people to do something else. If you're doing stuff to get the other people to do something else, that sounds like manipulation. It's a good self-look at yourself to see how you're behaving. Because I tell you what, man, in this life especially in this world we live in today, kindness is not very nice. People don't care about it. People don't respect it. People don't admire it. A lot of people look down on it. I've had a lady tell me that she doesn't need me to open the door for her. She's an independent woman. I'm like, yes, you are. Have a blessed day. Now, I could get offended at that. Be like, well, what about chivalry? What about respect for other people? But that's not what that is about. It's, a, it's about loving people regardless of how they act, what they do, and, and being an example of that. Because I tell you what, <laughs> I've had people in my life purposely be rude to me, purposely try to get me off my square, purposely try to attack me. And when you react in love, it's like water on a fire. It puts it out really quick. And a lot of people don't know how to react. And even if they stomp away, still mad, they will look back and say, wow, that person treated me with love when I know I was wrong. When I know I was being disrespectful, when I know I was being mean to them, and yet they still treated me with love? What does that person got? How are they so happy? It makes an impact on people. It really, it really changes their mind because people aren't used to love. People are used to acting a certain way and getting a certain response. But when you are Christ-like, a Christian, that Christ-like one, you walk in love, people feel that love in their life. It makes a huge impact. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off course a little bit here. I'm going to take you all over. I'm going to take you all over to uh, 1 John. In 1 John chapter 4, in verse 7, it says, Beloved, that's us, let us love one another, for love, love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, 
that we might live through Him. Verse 10, In this love, or in this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I love that scripture. Absolutely love that scripture. That's If you get a hold of that right there, you will think if you get a hold of this and this sinks into your heart and this starts to change your mind, you will adapt a viewpoint of how could I ever treat somebody rudely, inconsiderately? How could I ever judge somebody? Knowing that while I was a sinner in my sin, despised, hated, on my way to hell, God loved me despite my flaws. Despite everything that is wrong with me, the damnation that I deserve, despite all of that, He sent His only Son to die for me that I might live through Him. Not just breathe air. Truly live connected with God. His life flowing through me. His joy, His peace, His, his comfort, His wisdom, His love to be able to walk in that. If, if He loved me in that, that He sent His Son to die for me in my sins, He says in verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, if He so loved you, we also ought to love one another. I think a lot of times we justify our sin in our own mind and think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We start to compare, like I said earlier, compare ourselves among ourselves. This type of viewpoint is what puts us in a place to where we are able to actually look down at other people. But when you come to a viewpoint of, I'm submitted to God, I'm submitted to God, and now I'm going to turn around with what the acknowledgement of the fact that God has forgiven me, God loves me, and He saved me from damnation. He saved me from the, the place that I was headed from birth. He saved me from that despite my flaws, despite everything that was wrong with me. And He's given me the ability and the gift of His life within me to turn around and share that same life gifted to me with others. Wow. Wow. That's a gift. That's a gift that we no longer have to be condemned. We no longer have to be ashamed. We no longer have to have guilt. Because Christ took that for us. He was the Lamb sacrificed for our sins that we could live a life free from all of that. When you, do, when you mess up, which we all do, when you mess up, God doesn't see your mess up. You know what He sees? Christ. Now, not, that's not free reign to do whatever you want. I can just do whatever I want. I'm still going to go to heaven. No, that's not it at all. The Bible has many scriptures that talk about that. It's the fact that you have been washed 
in His blood, forgiven, redeemed, set apart and lifted up, set in heavenly places with Him as we are on earth. That's, that's, that's the, the stance we have. A lot of times we will we'll mess up. It's like, man, I shouldn't have done that. You know what? Next time I'm going to do better. But then what happens is we fall back and we say, man, I keep messing up. Man, I, I, I shouldn't have done that. That happened last week too. Am I ever going to change? Where's that at? That's not in love. That's not in redemption. That's condemnation. That's your self-talk pulling you out of the... It, it's, it's not just, oh, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. Yeah, I do that all the time. It's no big deal. It's, it's about a viewpoint. It's your eye. How you see yourself in Christ will determine your actions in life. The more you understand and know who you are in Christ, the more you will start to walk in alignment with God instead of hopping back and forth. Like, oh yeah, I'm doing good today. Oh, but I messed up. I messed up this afternoon. But at least I did good this morning. Maybe I'll give it another shot tomorrow. No. That's... that's that's still that's still that separation. You're still looking at separation. It's it's no, I'm one with God. I walk with God. God is with me every day, all day, in all my decisions. It's not just when I'm at church. It's not just when I have nice clothes on, clothes on and I'm talking to somebody and I got to put my Jesus face on. No. No, it's 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 every day, all the time in every action, in every thought that you bring into the obedience of Christ. It's every single one of those moments. It's not just when you have to put the Jesus face on. No, it's all the time. And it's definitely in your self-talk. It's definitely when you're talking to yourself because nobody hears you more than you. You're always talking to yourself. You're always either affirming toward forward or discouraging backwards. And really, we should always be moving forward. We should always be encouraging, uh, be encouraged and affirmed in the Word to the point that overflows to other people. And we affirm and encourage in other people. chapter 4 in verse 17 it says love has been perfected this is this is first john sorry first john chapter 4 and verse 17 says love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is so are we in this world. Not in the next. In this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves tor torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he loved us first. In the early books of the Bible, it says that a mind, well, actually, no, I believe that's uh, David, it says a mind stayed on Christ. That's perfect peace. And the reason I brought that up is because 
a mind stayed on Christ will have perfect love. A lot of times we get into fear when we take our eyes off of the love of God, when we take our eyes off of Christ and His promises that He, that he has for us, who He says we are in Him, when we take our eyes off of this, we start to fall into fear. Fear is caused by unknown doubt, unknown worry. You never fear what you know. You never fear the past. The past is gone. You don't fear what you know. You fear what you don't know. You fear when you take your eyes off of the truth, off of... <laughs> Uh, you take your you take your eyes off of the promises and off of what you know and you start focusing on yourself and what you don't know and the possibilities of things that haven't even happened yet you want to have peace in your life trust God Trust what God says. Trust His Word. Trust His promises. One of my favorite promises is that anything I'll put my hand to shall prosper. One of my favorite promises is that He will never leave me or forsake me. One of my favorite promises is, is that when I have my, well, I just said it a minute ago, when I have my mind set upon Him, I have perfect peace. Why are these my favorite promises? Because then I know that I can walk through life and anything I do, touch, walk, I have no fear. Because He'll take care of me. He'll take care of my family. Anything I touch will prosper and bless not only me but others. A lot of times my, the blessing I receive is in blessing others. And the joy and the peace that they have. But it's, it's really knowing that I can walk through my life, every situation, and know that I am victorious, I am blessed, regardless of what it is. And when it looks like doors are closing, God's already opening up more. There's a... Uh, a while back, uh, a few years ago, um, I had I was in a halfway house. I had got a job. Um, I was making um, about a thousand dollars a week at this job. It was fantastic, most money I ever made in my life, in, in that sense, and and I was loving it. And I was there for two weeks, and my managers were al already talking about promoting me into management. They were already like, oh yeah, we, we want to keep you around. We want to move you into management. And after two weeks, uh, my boss came in. A, uh, he was a district trainer for the state of Colorado and trained all over the, the state. And he came in and did his, a little speech for everybody before he went out that day. And he pulled me to the side and he's like, hey, Stan, I want to talk to you. So we went back in the office and and we walked in with my uh, facility boss there and a couple other people. And we walked back in there and I already knew what was about to happen. And he said, I'm sorry, we have to let you go. We ran your background check. We can't have you doing this work anymore. I was a mover. I was a mover. I went into people's houses, moved furniture from one house to another house. Um, I had theft in my background. Now... My present transformation didn't change my past. So I still, have to, I still had to deal with the consequences of choices I made in the past in this current situation that I was in at the time. 
and my and the boss at the time said, you know, it really hurts me because you were the only person that had a smile on this morning when I walked in. And he's like, we were really looking forward for you, for you to move up in this company. And I knew that it wasn't me that caused this situation, but was a dead guy that caused this situation. But I knew in that moment that God was going to bless me. You want to know why? Because I was in relationship. I was being diligent. I was blessing people, knowing that no matter what happened, God had my back. Even if I make mistakes, God has my back. And I thanked them. And they were like, man, this is, we've never had an encounter like this when we let somebody go. They're like, you're actually happy. I was like, I'm going to tell you the truth. The situation doesn't make me happy. But I'm blessed no matter what. So I went back to the halfway house and, you know, I was like, man, $1,000 a week was really nice. I was like, but you know what? God's got something better for me. And he moved me into a, uh, a shop full of some dark individuals to be a light. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was rough. That was a, that was a rough, rough area. Um, uh, mechanic shops are, they're not Christ-like, <laughs> to say the least. But I tell you what, I had an amazing opportunity to be a light to some gentlemen, to bless people, and it was great. And I stewarded the position I was in, even though I made a lot less money. And God continued to increase me, continued to bless me. And I was able to make an impact in other people's lives. But when this happened, other people seen the situation. Other people in my life seen the situation. And I had a brother of mine that was, it really hit him in the heart. And he was like, man, he's like, he's like I've never seen anybody act the way you're act, acting. He's like, you're, you're happy. You just lost a really good job. You're, you're like happy. I was like, well, yeah, I'm happy. I was like, because no matter what, God's got my back. And I had a job three days later. And he's seen that. And it blessed him and ministered to his heart. I'm giving these examples so that, so that you, can, you can take these in your heart and be like, okay, yeah, I'm starting to see now that regardless of the situation, I can be a light. Regardless of what, <laughs> it's, it's not, see, see if, if, every, if everything that came into your life that was a problem, God took away, you would never learn how to be patient, how to trust God, how to work through situations, how to be a light. The next situation that popped up would throw you into a tizzy again. But instead, what God does is He empowers you with peace, love, and joy to overcome the situation because the storm's going to come. The, the, the problems of life are going to be there. You're not exempt from it. As a matter of fact, if you're walking in alignment with Christ, you'll actually have more persecution and tribulations. But He empowers you to walk in joy and be an overcomer. And no matter the situation, no matter what comes your way, you walk in a way that speaks volumes to people around you. They will look at you and say, what does this dude got? What does this woman have that makes her so happy? When I feel so miserable and my life sucks, and she works the same job as me, and she's happy. It really speaks. But what we do a lot of times is we have a issue that comes up, and the first thing we do is run to God to take it away. God, I just can't stand this person. They just keep coming at me. I need you to just really work on their heart, Lord. Change them, because I just can't take this anymore. God, if you don't really work on their heart, they're going to be seeing you real soon. That's, that's not it. 
You know what that is? That's an opportunity for you to walk in love, kill your flesh, and be an example of Christ. That's what that is. And as hard as it is sometimes, <laughs> as, as excruciating as a living sacrifice can be, that's what we've been called to do. To be living sacrifices. To kill our flesh. To lay that on the altar and say, God, work through me. Work through me in this situation. Work through me in this, that I may be the light of the joy, an example of truth, an example of character, of dignity, of peace, of love, that when people look at me, they will have an opportunity to see Christ. That I don't complain every time something comes up. That I don't mumble and grumble. That every time that something comes up, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? This is an opportunity for me to walk in love. You know what? Actually, you know what? God, give me strength in this situation that I, I know that when I walk into this room with these people I'm about to meet with, that you're with me, and you'll give me the words. Because you'll be amazed how much you can change the environment of a room with love and peace and joy. Laughter really soothes the soul. Not only that, but it soothes other people's souls. You know, like, you know, it, it was, I use it all the time with my wife. You can ask her. You know, when we, when we talk or we get in, into discussions and where we're not agreeing, I try to make sure that no matter what, at the end of it, we're laughing together. That we walk away with our hearts and our minds soothed. We walk away in love. We're not holding on to something. We're not walking away from that situation and be like, well, you know, I can't believe she said that. Or, you know, he really, he really messed up this morning. He, didn't, he couldn't read my mind. So, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's coming to an agreement of knowing that no matter what, we love each other. No matter what, because we're two different people and we're both hard-headed. So it really takes Jesus to work it out. <laughs> and it's really the laughter and the peace of God that really just will mesh relationships. It will mesh you, not just in, you know, partnership, but also in your workplace. Joy and laughter really brings people together. It really is a soother of the soul. I've got a few minutes left. Um, when I first started a little bit ago, I was talking about stirring each other up in love and good works. And I really hope that this message did that. I really hope that this really made you kind of look at yourself and be like, Lord, I, I, I resonate with that. Like that's, that's something either I need to let you take from me and I need to work on that or kill that. Or it's, Lord, that really resonated with me. I want to do that. I want you to give me that perspective. I want you to work in my life in that way. I want to practice this in my life. Because it really is practice. Every little decision, every little thought, bringing that into captivity and the obedience of Christ, that, it's not easy. Transformation and renewal of the mind and being transformed is not easy. It's not a cakewalk. It's diligence. It's, it's self-sacrifice. It's being God-focused, not self-focused. I'm going to close this out in prayer tonight. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful night. Thank you for bringing us together that we could come together to stir each other up in good works and love, Lord. Thank you for this message tonight. I pray it fell on good soil. I know it did in my heart. I'm blessed every time. And I just want hope that those words, that you, the seed that you've casted out will land on good soil and bear fruit in these people's lives as they continue to walk out 
through their job, through their daily life, that that fruit will be visible to those they come in contact with, and that others can taste the goodness of God and come to repentance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.